So we're going to decompose this. So we did the form right here. So this is how it's going to look. We just have to figure out what are A, B, C, and D. So we have to figure out those four uh, constant values. So the best way to do this, fractions suck. The same first step, multiply by the denominator so you get out of fraction land. So that'll be our first step. And you can always find your denominator on the left side. It's that big denominator that you're trying to basically change around. Make sure you distribute correctly. You make a mistake on this first distribution step, and you got no chance of getting to the right uh, values. So from here, we'll try the easy method, which is plug in some x values. Now it's a little bit limited, because what x value makes those two zero? No. You can use complex values, but if you do, just make sure you do it carefully. You could use i or negative i. Uh, but I just, that's not the way I'm going to go, but you can use the imaginary roots that make these zero. But just so you know, you're going to have to plug in i everywhere you see x. So all these are going to become i, i, i. And then you're going to have a complex algebra problem, which you can still solve. But just to warn you, you're going to have a complex algebra problem. There is one x value that will make this somewhat better. It'll let us find some what well, one of these constants. Which x value makes a lot of this disappear? Which real x value? One. One makes all those x minus ones go away. So let's use the one x value that we can and figure out whatever we can from that, and then we'll go and do matching coefficients. So there is a one x value that we can use. So only one x value is useful here, which is x equals one. And make sure everywhere you see x, you plug one. So there's an x on the left side that we didn't have before. So that needs to get the same one right there. So this x value tells us that d has to be 1. So any questions on getting our value for d? We still got 3 to go. So what we're going to do is plug the value of 1 back in the original. So we're going to take this and put it right there where we see the and when we after we're done with that we're going to bring that to the other side. Now this last term has no more undetermined constants, so I'm going to subtract it to the side that has no undetermined uh, coefficients. So we're going to subtract x squared and subtract 1. So it's plus 4 minus 1, which is plus 3. So we subtracted that. And in this step, I'm also going to completely expand the other terms right here. So these terms are going to expand. And we'll do it carefully, and then expand this one. So 
So I'm going to do the first one in two steps. There's really three things being multiplied in the first term. There's ax plus b times x minus 1 times another x minus 1. So I have to deal with, there's three things being multiplied together. So I'm going to do the x minus 1 squared first, and then I'm going to multiply in the next step by a, ax plus b. So x minus 1 squared, x squared minus x minus x minus 2x plus 1. Do not be Do not be careless and say this is x squared minus 1 squared. It's not x squared minus 1 squared. It, if they were conjugates, that would be x squared minus 1 squared, but you're multiplying it by itself. And the second one, I can FOIL that out. So we have c times x cubed. I'll try to write in decreasing powers of x. So we got x cubed minus x squared plus x minus 1. And now we're going to multiply the first one. I'll multiply the a through. So we get ax cubed minus 2ax squared plus ax. Now multiply, distribute the b through plus bx squared minus 2bx plus b, and then distribute the c through everything, cx cubed minus cx squared plus cx minus c. All right, looks good. Good thing we didn't have the d hanging around. That would be even worse if we didn't get rid of that d and turn it into a number. The right side would be even worse. So we're going to group these in a different way. Before, they were basically grouped by the constants. A's and B's and C's were grouped. What I'm going to group it by now is powers of x. So I'm going to do, let's see, cube is the biggest x cubed. So I'm going to group all the x cubes, all the x squareds, all the x's, and the constants. So we're going to group by powers of x now. So we got a. I'm going to factor these as well, zoom in as far as I can and keep this on the screen. So I'm going to write my x cubed outside the parentheses. So I'm just going to write the coefficients, all the coefficients of x cubed. So I see one x cubed here. And it's a good idea to underline, or you don't necessarily want to cross these out because they're not canceling. We're just accounting for already writing them down. So another x cubed plus c. And that's the x cubes. There's only two of them. Plus, now I'm going for all the x squareds. So I'll underline them twice. So we have minus 2a plus b minus c x squared. And now we'll go for the x's. I'll underline three times. So we got a plus oop, minus 2b plus c. And everything that's not underlined should have no x's next to it. So here's the way we check. So I see there's b and there's c. I didn't miss any terms. So I've accounted, well, I have to write them down. But I'm going to, it's not necessary to group them like this, but I want them to look just like the other terms that I wrote down. So I don't necessarily need that last parentheses around b minus c, but I want it to look like all the rest. And we're going to do uh, match, matching coefficients. There is an x cubed on the right side. There's no x cubed on the left side. So how many x cubes do I have on the left side? One. Nope. No. No. Zero. So we've got zero x cubes, or no x cubes. You need to write that down so you know to match a plus c is going to equal zero. So there's no x cubes. That means a plus c need to cancel out. 
And then I can copy the rest down. We're not missing any other powers. Minus x squared minus 2x plus 3. So I'll underline in blue now what we're matching. So we're matching coefficients of powers of x. So we'll start with higher powers because that's how we started last time. So for the cube, a plus c has to equal 0. So we're just matching the coefficients in front of the x cubes. And I'll go with a double underline for our x squares. So <coughs> we have negative 2a plus b plus b minus c equals what is the coefficient of x squared on the left side? It's negative 1. So you can't just write like this. Oh, look, I wrote what's in front of the x squared term. So we know there's an invisible negative 1 hanging out, even though we don't write it out. It's totally reasonable to write negative 1x squared like that, just so you don't forget that it's really a negative 1 there. So last two, we got our first powers. So that's a minus 2b plus c equals, we have a negative 2. And last, our constant b minus c equals 3. So any questions on that process of how we took that big ugly equation and made four different equations from that guy? So I'm going to zoom in on just the four equations so we can forget about that ugly algebra up top. How do we solve four equations in three unknowns? So it could be a smart ass and say carefully. But what type of equations are these? It's a system of four, but what type of equations? Are they trigonometric, trigonometric exponential? Well, we're going to use algebra. They're all linear. So we can use matrices. So we got four linear equations and three unknowns. So we could use matrices. What's another? There's two other ways to solve systems of linear equations. Substitution is most people's favorite. And what's the other way? Elimination. Elimination. So you've got three main ways to solve linear systems. Substitution, elimination, and use a matrix. Matrix, a lot of times, will be overkill for this. So go ahead and do whichever of those three methods you want to do. I'm going to go matrix.
So this is our reduced row echelon form. I can cancel that second if I, I can knock out that last row if I want to. But it's a repeat, so it's not going to give us any more information. But here we have the A, the B, the C column. So you got A, B, and C. So even though we had four equations in four equations and three unknowns, if you set up your partial fractions correct, and if you did your algebra before this correctly, you should get exactly one solution at the end. You should not get a inconsistent or no solution, and you should not have free variables, if you remember all that fun stuff from linear systems. So this should work out perfectly, and you should get one solution. So you should get one number for A, one for B, one for C. You don't have to go linear system route. You could absolutely go elimination. Probably takes a couple steps, and you'll have a lot of equations written all over your paper, which I talked about in pre-calculus. You look like a mad person, mad man or woman, because you start having equations all over your paper. And what started out four equations turns into like 28 equations, and they're written all over the place. All right, so 2, 1, negative 2. We'll go back up and to the very beginning and drop those values in. So we're going way up to the beginning. Equals, let's take this blue stuff out. Don't need that. Uh, so which one was which? What number was A? 2. So 2 and then B? One and our C value? No problem, negative two. All right. And our D was one. Yeah. So, how do you check this? I wrote they're equal, but maybe they're not. So, you can go common denominator, add them together. Good news is, you know the common denominator. Is what the denominator we started with, so you just got to multiply by the right things and the right fractions and simplify down. So you should be wondering why are we doing all this decomposition? Because what we're going to do is use this algebra trick to integrate these functions. So we're going to take a complicated fraction and break it into the sum of partial fractions or I guess you could say smaller or more simple fractions that hopefully we can integrate those separately. So let's turn this into an integral right here. So our next example integrate So if I ask you to integrate this problem, it doesn't look like any of the forms we've done at all. You could try u sub, maybe you'll get lucky, but hopefully it was chosen so you won't get lucky and be able to knock it out with the one clever u sub. So u sub probably won't work here. It doesn't look like the other things we've seen before because it has as a product in the denominator is the reason. If it was just one of the two, I'd have a shot at it, so that's why partial fractions is used to break it out. So one fraction has one of the denominators, the other fraction has the other denominator, and then it looks like what we're used to. So we spent all that time doing algebra, so this is equal to let's see, 2x plus 1 plus 2 over x minus 1 plus 1 over x minus 1 squared 2 and that's a negative negative 2 all right so that was just algebra to do that and I probably shouldn't use the word just algebra but that was algebra it took a while to get there there was no calculus involved now we're going to do ca just calculus pretty much so this splits up into three antiderivatives, and the question is, can we find them separately?
So let's look at the first one. 2x plus 1 over x squared plus 1. Any ideas? Could try u sub, but what won't work out so well? Yeah, that stupid plus 1. Because derivative is 2x, not 2x plus 1. Now it would be really nice if it was x squared plus x, but you can't just change that around. So u sub won't work out so well here. What else could I do? Integration by parts, probably not. Just looking at this, it would be pretty exotic integration by parts if it worked out. We're running out of calculus tricks real quickly. What else do we have? Trig sub, there's no square root. So trig sub, really only great when there's that square root. And it looks like some squared stuff, plus or minus some other stuff. So all those fancy calculus tricks we learned are not going to work here. So what happens when calculus doesn't work for you? Algebra. Algebra. So what algebra can I do? Conjugates. Could multiply by conjugates, but I think that's going to make it worse. So this algebra move I'm going to make is going to be very, very simple. You're probably thinking of advanced things. Break the fraction apart on the numerator. So it's first plus second. And the algebra I did was a plus b over c, a over c plus b over c. That's all I did right there. I just, I call it unadding fractions. It was one fraction and you're going to turn into the sum of two fractions. So let's talk about why these are super nice antiderivatives. How do I do the first one? What's the first thing you should try? U sub. Algebra is another great tool to go for first. It's a very reasonable thing to think about for a couple seconds before you think all about all your calculus. So u, what's a good u sub? Squared. Plus, one. Plus one. du is perfect. Oh, look at that, 2x dx. You don't get much better u sub than that. So that's a really nice u sub. I'm not going to finish these problems here. I'm just going to show you the key step to <laughs> integrate them. What about the next one over? That should seem very, very, very familiar. You know that antiderivative, or your cheat sheet better know that antiderivative. Arctangent. Tangent inverse or the arctangent. It may be written as 1 over 1 plus x squared, but either way, it's the same thing. This is the arctangent. Antiderivative is arctangent. So it's just tangent inverse x. That's all that one is. You didn't even have a uh, A. Your A was just 1 on this one, so you didn't have to worry about what A was. All right, so that takes care of the first two. And now we're going to move on to the next ones. So what about that anti? That 2 doesn't matter, so you can ignore the 2 outside. 1 over x minus 1. That's almost natural log. You could do a guess and check. So it shouldn't be ln of x, it should be ln of what? Yeah, x minus 1. So the derivative is 1 over x minus 1. You could do a u sub. What would your u substitution be here? x minus 1, so du equals dx. And it turns into integral 1 over u du. So it is just the natural log of x minus 1. All right, last one. What can I do? This is not going to be natural log because it's squared. What could I do here? Let's see what that is. 
So it would be trig, or it could be trig if it was x squared minus 1, like that. You can do a trig sub, but because it's x minus 1 whole thing squared, the trig identities don't have a, they all require the variable to be squared, basically. So what else can I try? What's good u sub? Oh yeah, it's really good. So du is dx. And that'll turn into this. So with the same u sub, it'll work on both of these. You get a different result. So this first one, let me move the u sub over a little bit. I'll rewrite the u sub over here. u equals x minus 1. du is dx. So this first one turns into negative 2, integral 1 over u du. And if the same u sub works in two integrals, you don't necessarily need to rewrite the exact, you don't need to copy that exact same thing and write it a second time. That's a little bit silly. If you use the letter u, I know what you're doing. And this guy is 1 over u squared. Now that looks a little tricky. What if I read it as u to the negative 2 power? You do the anti-power rule. Add 1 to the power and divide by the new power. The only power you can't do that with is which number? Negative 1, because that's the natural log. Which, if you just add 1 to the power, you'll have 0. Divide by 0, that should be painfully obvious you're not doing the right thing. So if you try the anti-power rule and you're dividing by 0, well, something's going wrong. You're not thinking about natural log. All right, so that will be every antiderivative. You want to be a little careful because u means two different things on my paper. So technically, you, this would not be the best thing to write. Uh, but as long as you keep your stuff separate, I'll know what you're doing. The way to fix that is do a v substitution over here. So change that around to v's, and then you'll, you won't have that problem of u being two separate things in the same uh, equation. W is another good letter, or whatever letter. That's not x, y, or d. So we integrated, or we would be able to integrate all of this. So this is the point of partial fractions. You could turn a complicated rational function into a rational, basically bite-sized rational functions that then you can do individually, integrate those. So he talks about repeated factors, and you just have one of each power. And irreducible, if you have a quadratic irreducible, you have a linear coefficient. So we'll combine those two together into one problem. So we'll do our algebra first, and then we'll come back and do our calculus at the end. So we'll have a big algebra zone, do all of our algebra, and then we'll come back and write that expanded out uh, version. So we got quite a bit of algebra to do. So I'm going to use a lot of space over here for our algebra. So our fraction, it's really a 1 dx. So our fraction is 1 over x times x squared plus 1 squared. So we have our single denominator of x, and I can just write a over x, our first part. Our next part, x squared plus 1. Because it appears twice, I have to write it as a first power, x squared plus 1. And then my next fraction denominator will be x squared plus 1, whole thing squared. So you get 1 for each power when there's a repeated. So I'll write that in blue. Repeated, repeated twice. Over here you get one. So if it appears thrice, you'll have a first power, second power, third power. I don't know what the word for four times repeated, but four times, hopefully you'll never get that, but it would be first, second, third, fourth power. And numerators, you go one degree below your denominator. So we have b, bx plus c. 
On this last one, you might think, oh, well, this is really a degree four, but you look at the irreducible degree, not the overall degree. So the irreducible degree is just the inside, which is two, so your uh, numerator will have uh, just an x, so it's a dx plus e. And I think if you use capital letters, we don't really use many capital letters in the math that we're doing, so you can use d's and e's and Hopefully you don't have to go much past all the way to H and I. But even if you use I, it's, it'll be capital I, so you know it's not little I. And this E is not the natural base E, because it's capital E. So you shouldn't have any naming problems here. Between capital C and lowercase C, I know that sometimes they kind of get mixed up. Yeah, but remember, there's no, though at, at the very, very end, it'll be a plus C, yeah. but I won't have a, another C until that very last. Yeah calculus step. Uh, for further down the line, is there a way to distinguish the capital C from the lowercase c? That's however you write it. Not in my handwriting, there's not a way. Uh, I mean, you can try to do, you, x is another letter, it's a great example, capital versus lowercase. Uh, so if you can't distinguish your capital C from your lowercase c, it's a good reason not to use both of them in the same problem you're working on. Same thing with any other letter that your capital looks just like. Like P is another letter, and it's a capital lowercase. Don't use them both in the same problem. All right, so I want you to do this partial fractions now. You're going to have a slightly more serious algebra problem on your hands because there'll be four coefficients that you're going to have to work with. Oh, it's perfect time. Saved by the bell. All right, so this is your homework to expand this out. So you can take two minutes now. I'll walk around and help you get started, and then expand the rest for homework. <laughs> 